So this morning, we are starting a new series together. And this series is titled after a famous quote by John Wesley. And John Wesley, if you didn't know, is the begin, uh, the, one of the founders of this movement called the United Methodist Church. And, and I say that because it really was a movement. Uh, I mean, lots of people look at churches and they don't understand why we have so many denominations. And I didn't before going to divinity school and kind of learning about church history. I, as a new Christian who came into faith during high school, just thought it was just a bunch of like, you know, infighting and divisions and people being people, which certainly some of that's there. But essentially, one of the things about denominations is that it oftentimes just comes out of people trying to more authentically live out their faith within a particular context located in a certain place and time. So John and Charles Wesley found themselves as they were uh, leaders within the Church of England in England, and they never had meant to start a denomination, but they meant to preach the gospel and to care for those who didn't feel cared for. Exactly almost in the same spirit that Jesus had in the gospel reading here, right? Because Jesus came. He was the Messiah, the King of Kings, the one who was supposed to overthrow everything that was wrong and make it right in the world. And yet he came and was eating with the wrong people, right? He, he didn't eat with the people that were in charge, that were leading the mission of God in the world, which is to say the Pharisees and the scribes and the, and the rulers of the time. But instead, he met with the sinners and tax collectors and even elsewhere is considered, uh, you know, to be accused of a drunkard because he hangs out at those types of gatherings, right? With those type of people. Jesus came not for the righteous, though, but for the unrighteous. And he would tell stories, and he would say, there's a parable or the story of someone who lost the one sheep, and what does the shepherd do? But to go off and to find the one. Or the woman who loses the one coin that she had, and she unearths her entire house just to find the one and celebrates upon its being found. That God, it seems, in Jesus is on a mission. And it is on a mission of not the establishment of what religion had been, but on a mission to seek out all who had seemed to be lost in their lives. We just came off of a series uh, uh, that was um, moving, talking about five faith catalysts. Five things that help us feel steady as a rock in our faith. And the last one was personal ministry. And in many ways, this is a continuation of that last, that last sermon. That this per idea that if you are following Jesus and being a disciple and living into this call that God has for us, you will be leading something, doing something with your faith. That God never intended for the church to be the place we gather on Sunday to feel good for the week, but the place where we gather together to be equipped to live out our true Christian journey every day of our lives in all the circumstances that we find ourselves in and to lead in those places. There's a phrase, a disciple of Jesus Christ, someone who follows Jesus Christ. One of the most essential characteristics is makes other disciples. In fact, that's uh, in the United Methodist Church, our mission statement, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And to go back a little bit to John Wesley, he had a quote. That's the title of this series, the world is my parish. Because he thought not of his people that he was called to serve as just the people that he was placed under the authority of the roof in Church of England. But he felt his call was to all the people. If you listen to my, my devotional last week, which I invite you to, if you don't get our devotionals, you can subscribe on YouTube or you can subscribe to our email list and you can get those devotionals. But I talked briefly about how John and Charles Wesley felt that everyone needed to have the opportunity to hear the good news. At the time, during the, just the kind of culture out there, if you've ever watched, you know, uh, Downton Abbey, 
right? Have you seen that? Some of you have watched Downton Abbey. You know, you have the, the posh pomp and circumstance of the noble elites. Well, those were the people that were going to church in the Anglican churches, right? And so they would go to church with all of their hats and regalia. Everything was just ready. They were looking fancy. And then they would be singing not four-part songs that we sing in hymnals, but they were singing like eight and 16-part Bach, like, pieces, and it was just, you walk in, and you, if you were a common person that was working in like a textile shop or in the fields, you just felt out of place. Didn't have the right clothes. You didn't use the right language, because your words were probably much more vulgar than they were used to. And then you also didn't even know how to sing the music. You just fell out of place. And so, when someone feels out of place within the context of a church building, what do they do? They just don't come, right? They don't breach the wall or the doors of the church. And so John and Charles Wesley, who began this movement, were, you know, part of the Church of England, and they never meant to start a new church. They just meant to connect the people that were beyond the walls of the church, the people of the community that felt like the church was not a place for them because they weren't one of the noble elites. And so they found themselves up on the sort of the cobblestone. They would like get up uh, on the cobblestone uh, wall and they would preach to the people that were in the fields. And they would talk to the people on sort of normal language. They would go and visit people in prison. They would bring the good news beyond the walls of the church. And so when John was talking about what does it mean to lead a parish, He said, the world is my parish. Not the people in the pews alone, although they were part, but the world beyond. I came not for the righteous, but I came for the sinners, Jesus says. The sick are in need of healing. The thing, though, is is that many of us We hear words that we use in churches like call and discipleship, perhaps even when I said to make disciples of Jesus Christ, that that's your charge. You thought to yourself, I am not adequate for that. Pastor Brian, I don't know how I'd even do that. Last time I opened my Bible was who knows how long. I have all of these questions and doubts that I really need to figure out before I start leading people in my faith. And if that's you, you're in good company because the Bible is full of those people. And if that's you and you're in good company, I promise you there are some leaders in this room and worshiping with us online that currently feel the same way even though they're in leadership positions of our church. Because, friends, everyone who gets called into this task of leading within the context of church feels inadequate. And the people who don't feel inadequate are probably the people you don't want to follow anyway, right? They're the people that stand up and say, I am the perfect person for this job, especially if you give the church more money because God will then bless you abundantly because I know I got this line to God and it works every time I call. My prayers are answered. My interpretation is impeccable. You don't want to follow those people. They scare me because the truth is, is that we're all flawed and all marred. And none of us are capable of embodying Jesus in the world, period, because none of us are perfect. In fact, that's the whole point. We're all in need of Jesus. And so if you feel that you are inadequate for this sermon series each Sunday, and you get this, because we're going to be talking about some practical ways that you can lead outside of the walls. And if you feel uncomfortable, you're in good company, but don't give up there. Don't stop with that feeling of uncomfortability because the reality is is that none of us are comfortable and we're all being called to go beyond our comfort zone, to go beyond the walls. John and Charles Wesley didn't know what they were doing. And in fact, they they were just kind of going along, right? They stumbled upon this thing called the United Methodist Church because of the, you know, the, rev- the, the war with England, the Revolutionary War. All the English, England priests that were in the eastern part of the United States leading churches, right? Well, once the war broke out, what did they do? They brought them back home to England. 
And then all of a sudden, all of these communities throughout the East Coast that had churches that they could go and gather around the table and receive Holy Communion had no one to lead. And so then John, who was already working in the area because he was doing this ministries and, you know, empowering and enriching and bringing the church to normal people, right? He was like, well, it's not good for people to not have communion. And so all of a sudden, he starts ordaining people to have communion because he believed it was so important to gather around the table that all people could do it. And then that's where, you know, the bishop of the time said, oh, hey, John, you can't, bow, you can't ordain people. And then that's when the United Methodist Church started, started in the United States, the Methodist Church, as a movement that was kind of broken off because we were just trying to gather people around the table and started to give people who probably shouldn't have had the authority to do it, the authority to do it. But that's in the spirit of what Jesus does, gives people who shouldn't have the authority to lead God's mission in the world, because that belonged to the Pharisees and the scribes. He gave it to the people that, well, shouldn't have had it. Friends, my scope as a pastor is limited, because people hear everything I have to say through the lens of a pastor. Oh yeah, well, the pastor is supposed to say those things, right? So if I tell someone God is good, the pastor is supposed to say God is good. If I give someone my interpretation of the Bible, the pastor is supposed to give their interpretations of the Bible, so on and so forth. You get the point. My reach is here. Your reach is so far greater than my own. I got roped in this past week to doing an exercise of social media. And I roped in our director of communications, Stephanie, told me, I've got this wonderful idea for you, Brian. And she told me I needed, and so some of you have seen this video, but she told me I needed to do a video from, and she's been telling me for months, actually, I think over a year, because there's a popular video on social media of this guy who was singing the song Fleetwood Mac Dreamers on a skateboard, just riding along, and then drinking ocean spray, uh, a cranberry juice, okay? And Stephanie saw this video, and she goes, Brian, you have to do this video. You've got to do this video. But instead of drinking cranberry juice, you need to drink Welch's grape juice and hold bread, and we can use it as an advertisement for communion. And I had all the reasons in the book not to do it, and finally, you know, like, she's like, okay, you need to do it over by the Lanikai uh, lookout uh, spot, the pillar there, and I was like, Stephanie, I'm going to, like, hurt myself badly. I'm going to end up in the ER. There's no room in the ER right now. I can't do that. So, you know, that was my excuse. And then she's like, so then just do it here. And so I did it. I got on, it's on social media. It's there. It's on Facebook and Instagram. You can find it. It's me riding a skateboard, drinking Welch's grape juice, and singing the song Dreamers. Friends, it got over 1,500 views in like five days, okay? And you want to know why? It was because someone, a few people saw it, and you want to know what they did? They shared it. They shared it. They thought it was funny enough to share in their own personal social media sphere, and then all of a sudden, when our normal viewership is like, you know, 150 here on Sunday mornings that we'll get over the course of the next week online, it turned into like 1,500 views. My reach is limited, right? But your reach is beyond that. I say, I say that regularly, you know, to share if you like some of the stuff that we do, because your sharing, just simple click and share, then now all of a sudden reaches all of these other people. The thing is, though, is that is just a symbol. That is just a symbol of what I believe the power of the church is. One of the reasons why I got into this thing called ministry is because I believe that the church is one of the greatest potentials for change in our communities. I truly do. We have a a diverse group of people that gather, especially in the United Methodist Church, we have a diverse generational gathering together, and we all do different things in our lives. So many other social settings that we find ourselves in are either just like work over here, or my family connections over here, or you have sort of this, you know, rowing club or whatever club that you're a part of. But church is this eclectic hodgepodge of people that if we lived out being the church, not gathering on Sunday morning, 
But being it in our everyday lives, and we allowed the words together corporately to change us, we could impact the world. Truly, we could. I remember in an environmental uh, caring for creation class, we brought in some uh, you know, PhDs in environmental care and what can we be doing and all of that. And you want to know what they said their current tactic was? They weren't going to go to schools anymore. They'd been there. They weren't going to do flyers or hold events at the farmer's market. They'd done that. They said, if we can only get into churches, we might be able to start impacting the communities. That it was literally a strategy in North Carolina that they were starting to implement. How can we get this information into churches? Because they might be able to reach a diverse audience that don't show up to these other things that we have. The world is my parish. And you might be thinking, yeah, but I come to church, and that's good. This morning, I put up next to the communion table the baptism font. I put it there for a reason. Because when we respond to the love of God in our lives, when we respond to God's grace, you know, through reading the Bible, coming to church, and doing those things, you are now swept up into this thing called a call upon your life. And that's the same call, friends, that Jesus gave Levi, the tax collector. Get up and follow me. Turning on our live stream, even when you're at home, coming to church, reading your Bible, doing those things are ways in which that you have began to answer that call follow me. But it doesn't end there. The priesthood of all believers, our baptismal call and identity, is to go and to continue to share the good news. And you know me, a lot of you know me at least, is that I do not think that means you need to take your Bible and start, you know, telling people what to believe because the Bible says so. I believe it means inviting people to the table. And that's our shared table, but your tables in your homes, in our community, the coffee shops, the, you know, restaurants, the beach parks, the places where we gather outside are the greatest potential to bring community and to bring good news. Because you can invite a friend who's been lonely for the past six months to church. But right now, especially, we're still wearing masks and we're not doing fellowship hour, we're not doing some of those things. But if you invite that person that's been lonely to an opportunity for community, that can change their lives. In fact, it can save someone's life, too. And we all know people. They've moved to the island recently. They're still trying to find community. We know people that haven't had community because they haven't been able to gather. I'm not trying to tell you to throw a 20-person party. That's not what I'm trying to say. But think of each day in your life as an opportunity to share God's love in the world, in the community. And that's going to be our charge. And we're going to go over some, some practical like, realities to that like cultural competency and how do we gather people with some sense of consistency. And, and they're things almost like a leadership training course. And again, you might feel, well, Pastor Brian, that isn't for me. It is for you because it's our shared discipleship call is to go because the world is our parish. And there's people that are lonely in our community people in need of a a neighbor, people in need physically for a roof over their head or food on their table. So join me, let's join together, and let's be the beauty of change in our community. Not because we're doing something different here in this place, but because we're living it out beyond the walls of this place and being the church. Because the church is the people, not the place. The gathering around the table is vital and important, and we started as a United Methodist Church because we thought it was so important, and I do believe that. 
only insofar as you take the body of Christ. Let it come into you and be a part of you. And then go and be the body of Christ in the world. And even though you don't think you can do it, none of us do. And neither do the disciples. So go and be the body of Christ in the world. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the task, I guess, of being your presence in the world. It's more of a thank you because somehow you make us able to be it than it is something that we felt we deserved. And we know that we need you in this endeavor. So help us be changed by your love, by the words that we share corporately, changed around the table, so that we may be love in the community. And it's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.